live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. Good evening and welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Are you happy to be here? I hope so. Good, good. Well, welcome to the Science Cafe. My name is Chris Smith. I'm the curator for the Daily Planet Theater, and I'm your host tonight for the Science Cafe. In fact, I'm your host every Thursday night, so come back and see me a lot. Uh, raise your hand if this is your first time, though, to a Science Cafe. Look at all these people. Give them a round of applause. We welcome you in, and we hope to see you back at all the Science Cafes. The Science Cafe is all about finding out what's going on in the world of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and sometimes even the arts and the social sciences, and bring those people here into the museum, into a place where you can get a bite to eat from the lovely Daily Planet Cafe, grab a beer, some wine, if you're of age, and, and actually hear something interesting. Hear a talk from an expert in a field, learn what's on their minds, what's going on in their field, what's interesting, what's current and relevant, to us going on right now in the world. And then what I love about the Science Cafe is that we flip the tables. Rather than us sitting here for an hour and listening to the scientists talk, the scientists talk for like 20 or 25 minutes, and then we let you do the talking, right? Katie and I will be out here on the floor with microphones, and we'll let you ask your questions of the experts that we've brought in to the museum. I think you learn more that way, right? Like if I have got a good question on my mind and I can ask someone, who maybe knows about that, then I'm probably going to learn more about it than if I just Googled it on my own and tried to figure out the Wikipedia article on something like CRISPR or gene editing, which I'm very glad that we have experts on this particular topic because way over my head. I know, here's what I do know. I know that scientists are people who are passionate about solving problems. Right? They see something going on in the world around them and they want to do something about it. And they're always looking for tools, right? Science itself is a tool, but they're looking for ways to solve these problems or ways they can learn more about an issue that leads them to solving some particular problem. And John Godwin and Jason Delborn from North Carolina State University are working together to try to solve problems with teams of other scientists, I've learned just now this evening, internationally even, using what we've learned now recently about new gene editing techniques, ways that we can alter the genome to some desired end and do it with this new tool called CRISPR more cheaply, maybe safer. And now it seems that if you look up or you see news articles or maybe hear on the radio, CRISPR is taking the world of science by storm. It's, it's like going from using a hammer to like one of these big air powered drills, right? If you're gonna, when I was, a, I have to tell a story now. When I was a kid, my granddad and I were going to build a deck onto the house. We started that project with a handheld battery powered cordless drill. This is like 10,000 screws that have to go into this deck. Well, he wisened up after the first day of working and went and got a big air compressor powered, you know, like mega drill. We went from doing one screw an hour to like a hundred screws an hour and the deck got built a lot quicker. When I was talking to John and Jason before the cafe, for some reason that story was what popped into my mind because we've gone now in just the space of a couple of years from older <laughs> techniques of gene editing that were more expensive, less safe and took more time to now these incredible and powerful new tools that scientists have to solve problems that they see going on. But of course, something like editing a gene and altering the genome of an organism comes with questions, right? That automatically for us could raise some issues into, you know, if you have strong and powerful tools, what do you do with them? How are we gonna use them? And who's thinking about how the people who use them use them? So tonight we have 
John Godwin. He's from the Department of Biological Sciences at North Carolina State. And we have Jason Delborn, who's in Forestry and Environmental Resources, but he's also with the Genetic Engineering and Society Program at State. We have a scientist and a social scientist, both sides of the same coin, who are thinking about problems, how to solve them, and thinking about the people who solve them. So without further ado, give them a round of applause and welcome to the stage, Dr. Godwin and Dr. Delborn. Okay, well, thank you, Chris. Um, thanks to Katie and the museum folks for setting up, and also Carolyn Leitchew and Michael Vela, who were um, instrumental in getting this together. So I want to thank all of you as well. Uh, I think I'll preface it by saying, so Jason and I are both part of a multi-institutional, multinational project uh, that we're just launching, and we're just actually two parts of this. Of, um, and we have a number of other investigators, including around the United States, as well as in New Zealand and in Australia, really critical collaborators. And this is focused on a really fundamental and important problem that has defied easy solutions. And so we're exploring this new approach using CRISPR and editing genes. And uh, so this is actually the first time <laughs> that we have directly engaged the public. There have been a few press pieces, and you'll see some, some titles on those, and I'd be happy to send those to anybody who's interested in learning more. Uh, and we'll describe this um, over about 20 or 25 minutes, but we definitely want to leave time for your questions and your thoughts. Um, so this is our first time doing this, and we think that this is really critical that um, this sort of engagement proceeds in parallel with the development of the technology. Okay, so uh, what is it we're trying to do? Uh, so our specific focus is on islands and the threat that invasive rodents, and the mice in particular, present to biodiversity. So why islands and why this particular problem? So that's illustrated on this slide. Islands are less than 5% of the area on Earth, less than 5% of the land area. However, if we look at where the endangered species are, about 40% of the endangered species we know of are on these islands, so a very disproportionate um, number of endangered species on these small land areas. And fully 80% of the extinctions we know about since the year 1500 have occurred on these islands. So they're biodiversity hotspots, they're also in extinction hotspots. Uh, this is just an illustration from a recent paper. This is last year by Doherty and colleagues. And the main thing to um, notice is across the top, there are a, a, a series of invasive mammalian predators. And in the three bars, you don't need to look at it in detail, but there's birds, mammals, and reptiles, extinct species we know about, and threatened species. And so major culprits in terms of overall numbers are um, cats, which can be very damaging, and invasive rodents. Uh, and you can see the numbers there. We're talking about a very significant biodiversity threat. Uh, so why are we focused on mice? Um, for several reasons. One of them is that mice are really the best understood mammal in terms of genetics. And we have the most tools to go in and ask questions about its genome and also do manipulations in the genome, which becomes critical for what we're talking about. Uh, rats are probably the biggest threat to island biodiversity. But mice are a, a close second, and they're actually harder to deal with with established methods. So if you look in the lower quarter there, if uh, actually if you don't do this before lunch, but you can actually pull up a video on YouTube of mice on Guff Island in the South Atlantic attacking albatross chicks, literally eating them alive. And this is just one example of the threat they pose. Uh, there's other threats as well. So there are zoonoses, if you go to the bottom right corner there. Um, so diseases that rely on rodent vectors, one of the most well-known ones here and the biggest public health threat is Lyme disease. Um, Kevin will refer to an effort by Kevin Esfeldt of um, MIT related to that. And then uh, destruction of food. Um, so food security is a major thing. So rats, it's estimated. Uh, destroy enough rice in South Asia to feed about 200 million people a year. And so it's, it's, it's a major impact. So when we look at islands and we look at these invasive rodents, how do we deal with it now? 
And um, this approach, the approach that is most widely used, is aerial broadcast of toxicant compounds. These are uh, actually things that block clotting. They're an anticoagulant. Um, warfarin is the one that's most familiar to people, but they're second generation ones. And I want to emphasize that this approach has done tremendous good for island biodiversity. And I'll, I'll follow this, up, this slide up with a, one illustrating that. There are a lot of problems, though. Uh, it turns out to be challenging logistically. It can work on small, uninhabited islands, but it becomes very, very difficult for most islands. Uh, there are animal welfare concerns. Um, there are uh, issues especially with using this on inhabited islands where it becomes very difficult. On uninhabited islands, you don't, of course, have people, kids, pets, livestock. And so this makes this very challenging to use these toxicant approaches uh, on most of the world's islands, actually, about 85 uh, so, um, percent. Uh, so we've developed this partnership, and we call it GBIRD, which is short for Genetic Biocontrol of Invasive Rodents. And just want to emphasize, this is this multinational effort, so colleagues from Landcare Research in New Zealand, CSIRO in Australia, CSIRO, University of Adelaide, uh, USDA, Texas A&M University, and Island Conservation, which is an NGO which is focused, a very focused mission on removing invasive vertebrate predators from island ecosystems. Okay, so why genetics? What might a genetic approach offer? Uh, and you could ask, is the genetic approach really that new? And the answer there is actually no. We've been using genetic approaches for decades. Some people may be familiar with the sterile insect approach, which has been a major boon, for example, to the United States cattle industry in removing these screw worms. Uh, this idea has been around, um, actually the specific idea of gene drives for a good 15 years or so. Um, so what's different now? Uh, this is actually um, on the uh, left side there, are just a couple of fruit flies. And this is a fairly innocuous use of a gene drive. Gene drive and the effect it has is to make the flies yellower. But this was the first demonstration of um, this uh, mechanism called a gene drive, and I'll explain that in a second. And the uh, people who published this in Science Magazine were Valentino Gantz in the foreground there and Ethan Beer, and they're at the University of California at San Diego. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what's different about a gene drive? Why do we think that this is something new and different when we have been manipulating genomes for a while and we've been using genetic approaches to pest management for some time? So this is uh, normal sexual reproduction, and hopefully people can see that, but focus on the little pink dot there. So you've got, say, a mosquito carrying a unique trait. Um, perhaps the best case scenario and one that people are working on uh, is imagine it could not transmit malaria, okay? Now, so you introduce this into a population, and ordinarily, it would essentially get diluted, right? It would not spread in that population, okay? And this is the sort of reproduction and sort of spread of a genetic trait we've known about for a very long time. How does a gene drive change things? Uh, what happens is in this mating, if you look on the right side there, um, here we've got our, our um, red mosquito parent, all of their offspring, because the way the gene drive works, will carry that trait. And so this, um, if you follow that down through the generations on these different levels, you can see on the bottom, this is theorized, and there's ways that this could not work, <laughs> but this is theorized that then lead to the spread of this trait through an entire population. So you can imagine if you had um, white-footed mice that couldn't carry, um, help transmit Lyme disease, you had mosquitoes that couldn't transmit malaria, this could be a real benefit comes with questions, and we'll get to those. Um, okay, so just a little bit more. I'm not going to go in deep into the gory details of molecular biology, so don't be afraid if this is your first time at Science Cafe. I don't want it to be your last. <laughs> uh, so this is just a, a quick rundown on how this works, and this actually comes from an article on our mouse project in Audubon magazine this summer. So two mice meet, and uh, they have a magic moment. Um, <laughs> um, a uh, chromosome comes together from um, uh, the two parents here. Um, so you've got, if you look on the, the left side, we've got this gene drive. And it's carrying a few pieces. So in light blue are parts that are also found in the wild type DNA. And what really is critical for the gene drive is the part in the middle. So there are these molecular scissors 
actually the, some molecular biologists probably would call them scissors, very fine scissors or tweezers rather than a power drill. No offense, Chris. <laughs> um, and then uh, a cargo of some sort. And so in this case, it's a gene that actually for, is carried by about half of us in this room, um, the males. And this is the sex determining region of the Y chromosome in this case. But you can imagine lots of things that you could put in there, right? Okay, so then the next step is uh, uh, this CRISPR system, and specifically um, most applications, this Cas9 enzyme, it acts as a sort of very targeted molecular scissors and it makes a cut uh, in the other chromosome that doesn't carry this drive. And then through mechanisms that exist in all of our cells for DNA repair, um, when that cut is repaired, the gene drive gets copied. And so now you've, where well, you started with one on the left, now you've got both chromosomes carrying that. And this is how it can spread. Uh, and so to steal a figure from a recent very nice paper from Michael Vela from a couple of weeks ago, he's thought a lot about this, how these would work in populations. Uh, this is the sort of thing you can get. So the frequency of this drive, um, this um, drive allele, um, increases over time across generations, and in the meantime, it's is reducing the frequency of the wild form of that gene. And if you have deep penetrating questions about how that works, we have just the man to answer them right here. <laughs> uh, okay, so how might we employ this? So this is a paper from about 25 years ago identifying this gene. And so this, uh, this is this SRY it's called. It's on one of the Y chromosome. It is the, the necessary and sufficient gene to make an mammal a male. And this particular mouse was one of the first ones carrying it. He was actually sterile because you need more than that to actually be fertile. But he was nevertheless very sexually motivated. So this was done in Britain and they named him Randy. <laughs> Um, so just jumping into mice, again, just to remind you how this works, in a normal, it's a standard Mendelian in inheritance, so Mendel the monk who figured this out with peas, in a normal mating, uh, a male would mate with a female and half of the offspring, in this case, they become male, as they're not carrying this gene drive. In the gene drive situation, um, the male mates with the female, but then again, that, if you look at that little I'm not sure how to describe it, the little spotted chromosome with the little red burst coming off the upper left, uh, that copies itself over. So every offspring um, then gets a copy of this and it spreads to the population. So for our purposes, for bringing down populations of invasive rodents on islands, it might work like this. So again, you got the magic moment. All the offspring inherit this gene drive is symbolized by the, the orange mice and so this is carrying this masculinizing gene in this example, and they become males. Um, and I guess they tell two friends, if anybody remembers the old uh, shampoo commercial, <laughs> two chromosomes. And so all their offspring carry this, and they become males, and they mate with wild-type females. Nope. I just made... That's too controversial. <laughs> oh, I turned it off. And then the world ends, apparently. No, kidding, kidding. Um, <laughs> so, in, uh, and the models support this, although there's a lot more work that needs to be done. In theory, then, your entire population becomes males, and you don't have to actually be a population ecologist to know that this should reduce the population numbers, right? Um, there's other ways you could do this, and I'd be happy to talk about them. There's lots of lots of possible changes you could make. One approach we're exploring is actually all females, which has looks more promising in some ways. Uh, okay, so this is my cue to turn it over to Jason. <laughs> so some of you may be asking or having questions about um, this approach and the advisability thereof. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, so this is a, an image from the movie Jurassic Park. Um, and it's actually amazing when scientists talk about these technologies, uh, the reference to Jurassic Park comes up a lot. Um, in terms of the power of these technologies, uh, the dreams and inspirations behind them, but also the questions of what could go wrong. And our scientists being overconfident, arrogant, foolish, uh, all those sorts of questions do come up around these issues. Um, and I think those are important questions. 
Um, those are not to be dismissed. So I worked on uh, an, a committee for the National Academies of Sciences that did a study about gene drives when they were first being developed in laboratories. So as of yet, there, there is no uh, manufactured gene drive that's been released outside of a laboratory. All of the scientific research about gene drives is happening in laboratories. But the National Academies of Science has convened a committee of experts to study the science and to think about the social and ethical implications of this research. And one of the unique things about this report is that our committee of scientists emphasized the importance of public and stakeholder and community engagement that should go along with the development of the science. And so we defined engagement uh, with text that didn't appear on that screen, which is fine. Um, but what, basically what we decided was engagement is about bringing groups of people together who may have different perspectives, different perceptions, different values, and different kinds of expertise, and bringing those people together to exchange those attitudes and perceptions and ideas with one another. So this is happening with scientists, with communities, with other types of stakeholders. And when social scientists talk about engagement around science, um, there's, a, there's a number of ways to think about it, but I think this is a useful typology. Um, it divides the way of engaging public audiences into three types. The first is public communication, which is simply when a sponsor is communicating and sharing information with the public. You could call that marketing. Um, and that's what's done a lot of times when scientists talk about doing engagement. They think about going out to the public and convincing you that you should think like them. That is a very frequent public engagement. Another type is what's called public consultation. And that's when a sponsor or an expert is interested in what the public thinks. And so they might conduct a focus group or a survey and ask you what you think about a particular topic. This is also somewhat frequent in terms of emerging technologies and learning about public attitudes. I'm sure you all have seen in newspapers and on the radio the results of opinion polls where people are called up and for some reason they don't hang up on those people and they <laughs> give answers to questions about things that they know very little about. Um, and that is called public consultation. The third category is what I think is more, is more special, which is public participation or what I think of as, as true engagement. And that's where information is flowing in both directions. So experts are learning from the public, the public is learning from experts, and there is an interaction there where both sides can learn. And in fact, one of the metaphors I like to use for this type of engagement is the metaphor or the image of grasping hands. And the reason why I think about grasping hands is that if you truly are grasping hands with someone else, something important is happening. What's important is that you are both at risk of being moved. And that's what engagement is, is putting yourself at risk of being moved, of having your mind changed, of learning something new. So you're not just grasping how the other person thinks, but you're actually in their grasp and putting yourself at risk. And one of the exciting things from my perspective as a social scientist who thinks a lot about emerging technologies and in society is that a lot of the scientists and investigators who are studying new ways of using CRISPR and other advanced gene editing technologies are interested in this kind of public engagement. Um, this is a picture of Kevin Esvelt, who's uh, a new professor at MIT. Uh, and he's, he's one of the leading gene drive researchers in the world. He wants to think about ways that this technology could be deployed responsibly and safely. So rather than going and thinking about going to another country where regulatory systems are, are weak, where it would be easy, where he might be able to convince people who don't know very much to accept his technology, instead, he went to Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. And he went to those islands of very wealthy people in the United States with arguably the, the toughest regulatory system around biotechnology um, in terms of emerging technologies. And he said to them, I have an idea. I think that someday we might be able to use gene drive in mice to interrupt the cycle of transmission of Lyme disease. Are you interested? I haven't yet done any experiments in my laboratory. I don't know if this will work. I haven't written funding proposals. 
I want to ask you first, are you interested? That is a very different way of doing science. Very different. Um, and I applaud his efforts. Um, what he, he often uses the language of putting the science in the control of the community and that he and his students and postdocs in the laboratory are the technical hands for the project. Again, that's a very different vision for the role of the public in an emerging technology. So I just want to mention, uh, John talked a bit about the science uh, within GBIRD in terms of the development of this mouse. And I want to talk a little bit about the plan that we have for engagement that is operating in parallel with the scientific innovation. So the first thing that we're doing as a social science team is a kind of landscape analysis of thinking about who are the stakeholders, what are the interests around this issue. Um, there are already many conservation organizations who are active on the issue of endangered species and invasive species. There are NGOs and interest groups who are concerned about the deployment of biotechnology. Um, there are communities near islands where this might be released someday. So we're trying to understand what is the landscape of actors and interests around this issue before the technology gets developed. Second, we're going to hold a stakeholder workshop of people that we identify in the, in the landscape analysis to bring them together to understand what happens when you put their concerns and hopes and interests in conversation with each other and how can we develop scenarios for the use of this technology that would be useful in talking to broader public audiences. And the third phase in our project is to do community fo focus groups in places where John and other scientists who are working on this mouse think that it might work on an island someday. And so we're identifying the communities, not, these will be un, uninhabited islands, so it won't be communities of people that will live on those islands, but communities on nearby islands or on the mainland who would have a particular geographic stake in this kind of experiment going forward. And I think uh, you know, this, this idea of engagement is getting quite a bit of attention. Um, this is an article that was just published in Scientific American this week. Um, it's funny, it actually says October 2017, so I'm giving you a view on the future. Social scientists don't usually do that. Um, but th there is a great deal of attention of thinking about what are the ways to responsibly and effectively engage public audiences and different sorts of stakeholders around these techno technologies because they are so powerful. I think the analogy that Chris brought up at the beginning of going from a hammer to a, a was a power drill or something like that, um, yes, a power drill can help you do your work very fast. It's also incredibly dangerous, right? You can get a bruise on your thumb from a hammer, but if you have a power drill or an air hammer, you can really do some damage. Um, and so that suggests that this kind of engagement is really critical for there to be democratic and collective decision making around the deployment of these technologies during the design phase, not simply when we have a final product on the shelf to present to the public. So thank you very much from John and me, and we'll take your questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for being here first off. All right. Interesting things to think about. So this is when we turn the tables on them. If you've got questions, show us your hands. Uh, and every now and then, stick your hands back up. That way, we can bring microphones to you. So I have a mic. Katie back there will have a microphone. We'll find you so that everybody in the room, even the people way out in the back, can hear the questions. So flag us down if you got something you want to know about. Hi. In the case of the eradication of the mice, What's the ultimate effect on the rest of the ecosystem where the mice are a part of it? Uh, so that's an excellent question. Uh, one of the things, regardless of how you approached removing invasive rodents from islands, is um, avoiding what's been called ecological surprise. For example, if you have rats, and, uh, and they can be very damaging to seabirds, uh, if you remove the rats, but imagine you also have cats on the island. Now you have a lot of hungry cats. And so you have to do this in an integrated way. So that's independent of a gene drive approach. Uh, what do we know so far? These islands, in, in every case, except those perhaps close to Europe and Asia, and very close, uh, these animals stowed away and they got there with us. And 
So that doesn't mean it's a simple um, question or a simple predictable result when you remove them. But what we do know is when we do this, we've seen fairly extraordinary positive results. And this is with these toxicant-based approaches. Just as one example, uh, island conservation uh, um, eradicated removed rats from Isla Pinzon in the Galapagos Islands. And this was a few years ago. And it looks like it was successful. And one happy result of that was for maybe biologists, um, nerds like myself, they were finding uh, species of snails and permanently monitored plots that they thought had long gone extinct. But perhaps relatable for everybody, certainly, is they saw perhaps the first surviving Galapagos tortoise on that island in 100 years. And so you, what we know, based on the eradications which have been done so far, and there have been quite a number of them now, is that on um, overall, certainly there's, I think it's fair to say, overwhelmingly positive effects on island biodiversity. But that's uh, certainly not to suggest that we shouldn't look closely at that and try to, and uh, certainly you want to anticipate these ecological surprises and avoid them. Does that answer your question? I have, can you, is this working? Uh, I have uh, read that the uh, scientists in the United States and Europe have been very, very cautious in making genetic modifications, but that in China they're much more free, they're much more freewheeling. Uh, is, could you address that, that comparing the attitudes towards, towards actually using genetic modification techniques in the, in the Western world versus China? I think you point out a very important issue, which is that we don't have international law of governing research on genetically modified organisms, whether they're gene drives or otherwise. Um, and so there's a lot of uncertainty around what will happen from scientists in one context and scientists in another context. Um, and that also carries over in terms of thinking about what's allowed to be released into the environment. So those differences are, are there. Um, and you know, our project doesn't have control over that. Um, but I think it's a really important thing for us to keep talking about. If I could add just a little bit to that. I think one other thing that your question touches on and what Jason what Jason said relates to is the fact that a gene drive modified mosquito or a gene drive modified mouse is very unlikely to respect international borders. Yeah. <laughs> and so focusing on ways to spatially limit the function of these gene drives is going to be really important. It's one of the things we're working on as well. So thank you. Perhaps uh, we have a president who will build a wall that will keep them out. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, that was unnecessary. Uh, um, the wall? <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, congratulations. I, th I think it's, it's really quite, first of all, the whole approach is wonderful that you described. Um, secondly, uh, move, uh, starting with islands is obviously a safer way to do this than starting in the middle of uh, a continent. Uh, so that's great. What I'm wondering is there also, we're having huge problems with invasive plant species. And uh, trying to remove invasive plant species is an enormous amount of physical labor and very difficult to do. Has there been any work done on trying to control some of the most destructive of our endangered, uh, of the, of the um, plant species, which are invasive plant species, which are threatening animals and other plants and biodiversity generally. One comment about that is uh, our, our National Academies Committee studied different ways that gene drives could be used. Um, and gene drives require sexual reproduction. And many plants don't reproduce that way. So any organism that doesn't reproduce sexually or that doesn't have a fast generation time is not a very good candidate for thinking about a gene drive. You want to add anything? Uh, as far as I'm aware, um, and you know, others may be um, familiar with examples. I'm not, but I think people are certainly considering this for plants that do reproduce sexually. And uh, but I think it's you know it's in its infancy. We we've got functioning gene drives demonstrated in fruit flies, in two species of mosquitoes, and in yeast is what I'm aware of so far. Uh, if I could note one other thing, and you mentioned an island is the place to try. 
it was that was actually originally how we got to thinking about this from a containment standpoint and it was later actually through our interaction with island conservation that we came to i think more fully appreciate the biodiversity importance of this thank you okay i have a, <clears throat> kind of a comment and a question together uh, you pointed out which i think most of us understand that uh, species like the mice and the rats and the cats and all that have arrived due to human activities uh, i.e. due to the most invasive species in the world, us. <laughs> yep, we are. So um, they ca all of these species came from a native habitat at one time or the other. And uh, the, the example of the mice, they have a very important place in the ecosystem, particularly because they are part of the food web. Now, they got there where they are by human activities. And I would be wondering if there's not the possibility of escapes of the altered organisms and going back and uh, creating devastation in their uh, homelands. So uh, this is a question I, I know the general public comes up with. How do we deal with it? So that, that's an excellent question um, and a really important issue that, that surrounds gene drive research. So, you know, I, I don't know if John said this at the beginning, but you know, we've been making genetically modified organisms for a number of years. The difference with gene drives is that they are designed to potentially spread and persist in the environment, which is a, a new set of characteristics when we consider releasing something that's been genetically engineered. And your question is exactly on target in terms of thinking, well, if you design a mouse that's supposed to collapse a species, to eradicate a species on an island, and a few of those mice, or even one of those m mice, escapes to a mainland, could it crash the species there as well? Um, and the answer is we really have no idea. Um, in, for a really interesting reason, which is that there, there are many scientists who are worried about gene drives doing exactly what you describe, and there are other scientists who are totally convinced that gene drives won't work. That what we've described as this amazing system to eradicate an island species simply won't work in the environment of reproducing wild animals. We don't know yet. However, despite that uncertainty at this stage of research, there's a lot of work going on to try to figure out how could you localize a gene drive? How could you make it stay in one place or have it not last very long? Um, in fact, the scientist who I put on the screen, Kevin Esfeld at MIT, has a technique he's causing, calling daisy drive. Um, and I won't talk about the molecular biology um, unless people are interested afterwards. But the idea is that uh, the, the gene is driven for a couple of generations, but the, the drive falls off. And so it can't last. And so in terms of modeling, and, and Michael's done this work in a, a paper that was recently published, if you have a daisy drive that escapes onto a mainland, there's much less chance that it would simply spread and wipe out that population. And there are other techniques Maybe, John, you'd like to talk about the, the technique that our group is, is pursuing for that kind of localized control. Um, without getting uh, deep into the details, uh, this system, part of what makes it powerful for all sorts of gene editing is that it recognizes you know, particular genetic features. And so the thinking and uh, that we need to test experimentally under highly biosecure conditions is that lacking that feature, as is often the case on the mainland relative to an island, this drive wouldn't work. So that's the theory. It has to be rigorously tested. Uh, if one other thing, if I could note, I think another point that your um, question relates to is there might be tremendous promise in these technologies, but you know we can think of that as maybe a great gas pedal, but it's going nowhere if we don't have good brakes, I think. You know, we have to have these measures, proven measures in place to control this, to limit these things spatially, to reverse them. And so I think that's, it's really important and people are thinking a lot about it. So you sort of partly answered the question right then uh, that I was gonna ask, but could you go into a little more um, technical detail into how exactly the gene drives would recognize the, the the pairing of the other chromosomes and sort of convert it over time. Like, I'm, I'm simply curious. Like, you don't have to get too technical, but I would like a little more clarity on that. So there are 
um, if you remember that cartoon from Audubon magazine, uh, you get that specificity out of base pair matching the way always happens with, you know, with all of our DNA, for example. And it has to be very specific for this mechanism to work. Now, one of the reasons it could fail is that a mouse or a mosquito or something else comes along that doesn't have that. All of a sudden, imagine this is something that's reducing the population. That mouse or mosquito or white-footed mouse, it has a huge advantage, and it probably will take over that population. So I don't know if that's getting at your question, but that's a big concern, so it might work for a while. So Jason mentioned there's a lot of scientists who are not at all convinced that this can work, and that's a major reason why, because that specificity is both the strength of the system, but it's also its weakness. There's some um, more complicated ideas about how to um, essentially protect against that. Again, they remain to be tested, though. So on, on this diagram, I just pulled up this slide to show if the scissors is looking for a very specific sequence, if that sequence isn't there, mm -hmm. then it won't cut and the gene drive won't spread. And so in terms of what we know about mutation, if, you muta if a mutation happens in that area, then the gene drive simply won't work anymore. So it's harder. Uh, so I, I get the, the whole um, specific, specificity of, yeah. <laughs> of the actual like this cutting using CRISPR which is a, a very specific um, restricting enzyme but how how does it know to then reproduce re replicate that certain section that would make the entire um, population either all female or all male like what what goes on to it because these are just tools they don't necessarily think in the same that we so like wh how what is the process there to make it so that it does carries out what you want it to carry out Okay, so you've actually precisely hit on the other major way we think that these drives can fail and stop working. And that is, uh, we think most of the time it's a really good system. And to really get in the gory details, is something called homology-directed repair. So it's copying based off the other chromosome. It's not the only way this can happen, though. You could just join those ends together, and now you've instantly created um, a chromosome that's resistant to the function of this drive. So yeah, you've exactly hit on the other major way it can fail. So. Hi. Um, yeah, back on a little bit of a larger scale, um, there, there's a paper that I read recently that, that um, where they got rid of um, the exotic invasive species that deals with plants, okay, in a system. And they left it alone, thinking that the old system would come back. And lo and behold, something new came back. Um, just, okay. Well, I don't know this specific example, but anytime you have an invasive species come in using resources and space, um, those, are, those are really critical. And when you take it out of that system, there's no guarantee that what formerly occupied that ecological space is going to succeed now. It might be another weed in this case. Um, so, yeah, ecology is complicated. I think at, at the same time, so it's, it's important to think about those types of risks. You know, this might not work. Another species might come in to take its place. There is a very small chance, you know, even under the best conditions, that it could escape to the mainland. Um, and the reason why I think engagement is so important is that we have tough decisions to make, right? We know that species are going extinct on these islands. We know that's happening. That is bad. That's a bad outcome that is certain to continue if we don't do something. And so we have to think about this kind of tool as a potential tool that we may want to use that has risks, just like every other intervention has risks. Um, and I would argue that it's not the scientists, it's not John's job to work alone to decide whether that risk is worth, t worth taking. That's our job, it's a collective job. And so that kind of engagement is, is key to making those kinds of tough decisions. Hey, so I know that CRISPR has not been perfected yet and, oh, thank you. It hasn't been perfected yet, but let's be optimistic and suppose it does work. Are there any possible applications for use in humans? For example, um, using it to remove a genetic disorder that is linked to a recessive trait to remove that from the gene pool. Uh, how many folks heard the story on NPR this morning? 
that um, there's a story actually this week, so it's a good prediction uh, that this is reported actually in human embryos for a genetically transmitted disorder. I think it was beta thalassemia. Um, it, it's a it's essentially a, a letter difference in the genetic code that leads to a pretty disabling disorder, and there's a lot of these. Uh, so we have, we think, the first example for that. Um, and I, I, I think it becomes more of a social question, um, and there's, we have, again, hard decisions to make. But technically speaking, for not for gene drive, that shouldn't work in humans because you need a rapid generation time, but certainly for these sorts of applications, um, some people might have heard about possible applications to uh, HIV AIDS, for example, where you can take out a small chunk of a particular protein and that can actually render the virus unable to infect cells. Uh, so, just, uh, so I think that's likely, but again, it's, this is why it's so important to talk about this because, again, I shouldn't be making that decision, right? We should all be making it together. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I mean, you seem like a perfectly smart guy to me, though. I think you can handle it. Huh? Um, this is just a kind of a follow-up question to his, because I noticed uh, that you mentioned mosquitoes. Um, are you working on just completely getting rid of mosquitoes, or are you doing, like what he was talking about, modifying a certain thing to take out, like, malaria? Um, and, you know, are, are we having those same conversations about whether that's ethically okay, as we are with, you know, we're obviously, you know, we're all worried about humans being modified and changed and, and those ethics, but, you know, are we worried about the same thing with, uh, with mosquitoes or other, you know, smaller things? So, so there is a lot of attention to the possibility of using these same kind of technologies for mosquitoes um, that John talked about in terms of mice um, for things like dengue, malaria, chikungunya, um, Zika. There are different approaches that can be used. Um, as John said, there, there has been research in a laboratory showing that a scientist can modify a mosquito so it did, didn't transmit one of those diseases and that that can be paired with a gene drive in a laboratory. Um, there are also thoughts of using uh, gene drive in mosquitoes to collapse populations of mosquitoes. One of the things that's, that's good to know about mosquitoes is that there are many, many different species of mosquitoes and only a few of them transmit those diseases. So in terms of an ecological impact, one of the positive signs would be that even, even if you were to completely eradicate Aedes aegypti, which is the mosquito that transmits dengue fever, there would still be plenty of mosquitoes to be around to bite you and make you miserable um, and feed the bats and the birds. Uh, you know, that needs to be tested, but that it, those ideas are being uh, discussed and, and researched by other teams that we know. Hi, right here. Um, two things. First, a comment. Um, when you were talking about <clears throat> one mouse getting away and potentially infecting other, other places, it reminded me of the Kurt Vonnegut book, Cat's Cradle. I don't know if anybody here has read it, but um, they had invented a form of, of ice that melted at, say, 26 degrees centigrade, <clears throat> and they could, they could melt it and turn it back to the water, but you put a, a drop of ice nine in it and it would com convert back. Sounds a lot like this story. Um, you know, just, just one drop, and, and eventually what happened is the earth froze be, because it was, it was too, too cold. But here's the question that, that I had, and it actually is a bit of a spinoff of what you were just saying. <clears throat> um, of course, the mice on, on any island will have genetic diversity, um, and how much diversity can, can this system tolerate to, to be able to, uh, to eradicate the population of mice? Um, you know, how much... How much changes there in the genome that, that your system won't work anymore? <clears throat> Excellent question. Uh, and the short answer is, well, essentially none for the target that you're looking at in the genome. Islands, uh, people may be familiar, you know, if you have one pregnant female start a population, they can be, uh, they can show strong genetic similarity within that population. So we don't know if this is the case, but we're going and looking for exactly those features that are fixed. So every single gene in the population is that. So that is also a reason why some results suggest that, imagine this gets off the island, there's diversity, right? And so um, most mice would not um, 
be suitable hosts. It would not function in their genome. Uh, so it's a, it's a great technical question. Uh, there's another approach that I'd be happy to talk about with you in detail, but it involves another molecular strategy for trying to get around that sort of um, resistance, so these resistant um, genomes arising in the population. So, so, But just to add, I mean, one of the reasons why it does work, you know, even in laboratory conditions, is that in parts of the genome that are well conserved, meaning that there can't be mutations, otherwise the organism doesn't function or isn't fit. So there are some sequ sequences that are very well conserved throughout a whole population. If the gene drive is targeting those, then it's very likely to work. Yeah. Jason's a social scientist who is excellent at biology. <laughs> so this is a question maybe more for Jason, and it's the, and it's the question about language usage and whether you're prejudging or, or pre-predicting uh, answers, especially in community community engagement, um, I'm drawn by the question, the use of the word editing for genes, which I'm sitting next to a woman who does editing, and I think of that as a very positive thing, but, you know, are, aren't we deforming them genes, and how do you choose the language you use? That's a, a really nice point, um, and I think, I mean, as a social scientist, I've studied and critiqued the way that scientists use language for particular purposes. Um, and I think the best we can do is to try to be aware of how powerful language is. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that molecular scissors is a fair uh, metaphor for what CRISPR does. Um, you know, some scientists want to say tweezers. Um, they want to talk about precision. But some of the early research on CRISPR is that it cuts in other places too. It's designed to cut at a very specific sequence, but it has some tolerance for very small changes. It's not perfect. It's not perfectly precise. Um, the metaphors that we use for the genome, like the code of life or the book of life, are metaphors. Um, and they communicate certain things about the science. And we need to be reflexive about the metaphors and words that we use when we talk to people about these technologies and we, when we talk about the risks. So it's a really nice point. Hey, uh, um I work in infection control, and I was curious how this could maybe be applied in that respect. Oops, sorry. Um, when you're really dealing with something that, that mutates readily, which is why we have in issues with infection control and antibiotic resistance, that kind of thing, um, also versus a high turnover rate, is there any chance this could be applied in that respect? And also, um, one of the bugs we're working on at the hospital I work at is um, the, the plasma that carries resistance gene is readily transmissible between bacteria. And so the problem would be then, if you wipe out its resistance, you wipe out all their resistance. So the next time you dose them with antibiotics, that, that's a carpet bombing. So would that, I mean, kind of thing be taken into consideration, or is that a, even a possibility? Because we've been talk, talking most about macroscopic examples. I didn't know how far down we could go. I think. Um, for gene drives specifically, you don't hear a lot of bacterial um, bacteria. You know, they do have means of exchanging genetic information. Actually, you referred to one of these things. That, uh, but they primarily reproduce asexually, and it's a requirement um, with this mechanism that it works through sexual reproduction. I hope, yeah, I'm trying to think of other things related to that. But um, I th um, I, there hasn't been a lot of attention thinking about gene drives for microscopic organisms because we usually are controlling them like in a vat or a laboratory. And gene drives, what, what they offer us in terms of a tool are to, to work with wild populations, populations that are not under our constant control. So you don't need a gene drive, for example, to transform a crop that you're going to plant or an organism that you're going to use for an industrial process. So I've got two concerns, well, one being how long before this gets into the hands of a grad student or a guy at home in his garage that they can affect without any of these sorts of reviews just on their own. And, and what would prevent these sorts of changes in one organism from jumping 
to, uh, you know, say another organism. I mean, I know there are some, you know, uh, small cases of, of gene transfer between species or, you know, certain organisms. Something like this possibly jump out of a mouse to another organism. Um, so the first question there, I think, is it's a really important one. Part of why biologists are so excited about this is it's taken a process that would take months or years and conceivably could be reduced to days now and it's probably not requiring a lot of specialized equipment. I, for example, I've wondered, you know, what could somebody do with a credit card in a post office box? You know, because you can actually have things synthesized online. So, uh, I mean, I think that your point's really well taken there. And I think an important um, uh, thing to think about is for that reason, we should be working on systems to counter this, and those efforts are underway. You could imagine some, uh, a small molecule um, that could block the function of this enzyme, for example. Um, other mechanisms which could actually remove a gene drive, we'll actually be testing one of those. Um, but it's really important to develop um, these methods for stopping gene drives, and that'll actually make promising ones um, um, available for use, I think. I think it, it'll reduce, hopefully, that risk uh, that we have to think about. Uh, and I'm sorry, your second question? Oh, yes. Uh, also another great question, and it uh, it depends a lot on the species you're talking about. Uh, so some species, um, species boundaries, it sounds like you're already aware, right, uh, are not um, complete. And so if you're manipulating a species that had a close relative occupying that same habitat, I think that's something that could be a major concern. Uh, when we're thinking about this for mice, we're thinking about it, for example, uh, in Australia. There are no native members of that genus even. There, um, there are in Asia, but we think that's a really important uh, feature. You know, don't do this in a native range. Ideally, when other people do this, you would be avoiding the sort of situation that you're talking about. Yeah, I think we're going to take time for just one or two more questions. Katie's headed to you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody take it. <laughs> um, as, as you're uh, gathering information on who the stakeholders are, what tools are you using to ensure that unusual stakeholders are included who are actually very common, like folks who don't have a lot of research, res resources or academic connections? Um, first of all, they may have knowledge of the ecological systems that have nothing to do with academia that could be useful, um, but also they have a right to have an opinion. Um, and so how are you, that, those are really hard populations for anybody to reach, so I'm wondering what tools you're using to reach into that sectors of society. Um, so the, in case people didn't hear the question of how do we reach um, different stakeholders that might we might not reach in, in our regular interactions, right? People I'm not gonna meet in an academic conference. Um, it's, an, it's an important question. Um, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of things. One is that our plan is to, to partner with community representatives to help us find the, the right people to engage. Um, so just as it's not John's job to, to decide what's ethical or not with these technologies, it's not my job to decide who should be in the room making the decisions. Um, and so I'm gonna rely on other people to help me uh, reach that diversity. And I think specific attention to issues of diversity is really important. Um, when I've done engagement around emerging technologies, one of the things that we've done is not to emphasize that we have a perfect um, percentage-wise demographic representation in the room, but to make sure that we have an inclusive group that represents the diversity of the community. Um, and so for example, I'm working on a project on the, um, it's not a gene drive, but the genetically modified American chestnut tree. Um, and one of the groups that we're partnering with are uh, Native American groups in New York State whose land is near where the release sites might happen. Um, and so, you know, so, some of those folks, they may not appear at academic conferences, um, they may not be, you know, vocal in terms of protest or concern, but we're reaching out to them to make sure that their voices are a part of the conversation. Let's give our speakers a round of applause. If you, 
If I could just note, um, I won't speak for Jason. I imagine he's receptive. Uh, again, you can just find me at NC State, and if you have other questions, I'll hang around afterwards. I'll be delighted to address them. And at my website, I also have some links to some of these articles, like that one, for example. Um, although you can also find it Audubon Gene Drive, I think, perhaps. Uh, but yeah, So please, that's another place to find out more about this one. Anyway, thank you. Uh, tell us your website. <laughs> Google John Goodwin, North Carolina State University. Yes. And you, Do and the we'll search box in the upper right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you both very much for sharing with us. Uh, it's, yeah, you can do that again. Yeah. Because they did a really good job. I, I think so. But when, when we all work together, right, when we're all talking to one another and not just staying in our one little part of our life, our one little silo, that's when cool and interesting and passionate things happen. So thank you. And... Thanks to all of you for coming out and spending your evening with us here at the museum. I do want to let you know about another opportunity to come back to the museum and do something else cool and interesting. Tomorrow night, the last Friday of the month, is our final Friday's Science and Cinema event. We've got a researcher from North Carolina State again, but from their Convective Storms Research Department. And we're going to be watching the movie Twister, followed by movie trivia and a Q&A with Bryce Coffer from North Carolina State. He's also a former storm chaser. I uh, saw some really cool pictures of him way too close to some pretty impressive storms. So come back out. Tickets for the movie are $5. Doors open at 530. We'll have the first floor of the other building in the museum open with lots of cool activities and games you can play. You can also get dinner and drinks before the movie. show starts at 7, and that's in collaboration with the AV Geeks. So we'll be watching some cool short films before that, too. Come and hang out with us tomorrow night. It'll be a lot of fun. And have a great Thursday evening, everybody. Good night.